Okay, I think we got enough people, enough participants. Um, this is the in vitro uh, breakout room. Um, I'm Darren Wallace at the University of Kansas Medical Center. I'm uh, co-chairing this with Paul Welling from John Hopkins University. Um, so, you know, the goal of this is try to find out what you guys might need as far as in vitro uh, models and how the uh, consortium might be able to generate new reagents for the, the PKD community. So. It'd be nice to, to have your input to find out uh, what directions this uh, our subcommittee should be going. Um, if it'd be helpful, I mean, if somebody wants to jump right in, uh, please go ahead. But if, if you guys want a, a list of the samples that we already have or the, the models that we have available, I can I can share the screen. I don't screen. I don't know if it's necessary or not. All right. I'll. Uh, Okay, can you can you guys see that? Okay. So as you yeah. can, as you can see that there's we have a number of of uh, in vitro models both uh, from human and from mouse. Um, you know both the the Maryland uh, group generates uh, primary cells as as well as I. Um, we have a number of animal models that have inducible knockout of PKD one and PKD two that. And those uh, those lines are very well characterized by Owen Woodward and and Paul Welling, um, and we have a num number of uh, biospecimens as well. Uh, I think last last time we had this session, we talked about the, the need for uh, immortalized human cell lines. So that's one of the the goals of our uh, our consortium. So. Uh, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say as far as what type of models you, you find to be useful. Hey, Darren, just to kick off the conversation maybe a little bit, like I do think that the immortalized human epithelial, kidney epithelial cell lines will be incredibly useful. Uh, with QC, probably being the asterisk uh, on, on top of it. Um, so uh, expression profiling either by transcriptomics or ataxic so that the, the how, how good a proxy they are of human kidney epithelium and what they're most comparable to, I think if it was overlaid upon those would be incredibly useful in terms of knowing what what to order and making sure that the community is not all doing the exact same QC on, on those cell lines. Yeah, that's a good point. Paul, you want to address that? I think you have more experience with, with this epigenome study. So I think this is a really a super question about the QC that is involved in any of the cell lines that we're developing. Uh, we've thought a lot about it uh, and I'd like to get your feedback. Um, so um, I think we've uh, tried to check off a few boxes that we think are really important. First uh, is the genotype. Do they really come as advertised? Uh, we're really trying hard to make these inducible systems so that you automatically have isogenic uh, control behind it. So a lot of thought is built into how to validate that. Uh, secondly, they have to be, uh, in this case, uh, we're really going after renal epithelial cells. We want them to be have the phenotype of a polarized uh, epithelial cell that are capable of forming electrically tight monolayers on permeable supports uh, that uh, can grow uh, as cyst in uh, 3, 3D gels uh, systems. Um, and um, all of the other kind of um, standard uh, QC that goes along with any kind of uh, cell culture uh, system. Um, so those are our priorities. Uh, we have uh, begun to do, this is on the mouse lines, begun to do RNA-seq on those. Uh, and I think that provides another uh, fingerprint uh, to follow uh, uh, cells in passage. Uh, so you 
If you did uh, RNA-seq at your place on our cells, you could compare them to uh, some of the earlier passages. Uh, we're also doing DNA fingerprinting on all of the cells so that you will know their, their origin. But I love uh, Jeremy or Michael uh, um, or others, if you have comments about other things that we should be doing on the QC, because this, this really is probably the most important thing that we, we get right. Uh, um, some cell lines we've sent out as beta versions and you know, with all the warnings behind them, uh, and uh, there's even discussion to, to stop that uh, and just get them right before we send anybody anything. Yeah, so Paul, that, that sounds uh, like a wonderful plan. And Jeremy, I'm impressed to see you in the lab. That, that is really, uh, <laughs> but- I, I was doing mini preps. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I would add, Paul, is it would be great also to have a set of standard conditions that produce a validated growth phenotype. In other words, if you grow these cells in Matrigel for the following number of days in the following media, we anticipate that X percent uh, will form cystic structures, et cetera, et cetera, so that there can be some sense of whether users of these cell lines are uh, observing the phenotypes that, that one would hope. Yeah, so that is going on. Uh, that's a little bit more challenging uh, given our bandwidth, but uh, um, that, that, that is something that we're doing. And we're trying to share that amongst uh, all of the institutions so that if it works uh, in Baltimore, does it work uh, in Kansas City kind of thing? Yeah, we'd like to have standard protocols for the different assays using these reagents. Um, that'd be the kind of our, our end, end point there so that we can just send out the protocols and, and the cells and, and, and each investigator be able to, to reproduce the, the uh, phenotype that we've characterized. I think one of the challenges with uh, optimizing growth rates is that a proximal tubule cell may be different than a collecting duct cell. And uh, this is uh, a challenge for us to come up with like a standard recipe that does everything the same. Mm -hmm. I think where we can start is starting with a standard recipe and telling you what happens. Uh, rather than optimizing things. Yeah, no, and I, I think that that's all I, I would certainly ask for is to have a sense of if I'm using these cells and don't see what you report other users or you have seen, then I'm doing something wrong or my media is bad or my serum's bad or whatever. But just to know that others have used these cells and there is a documented phenotype for this given cell line under these given conditions. And, and I understand the bandwidth issue, and that's something that maybe can come from your early adopters rather than from your own uh, facilities. Yeah, I, I thought that that plan sounded great, Paul. I mean, as a member of the user community, I feel like it is my role to ask for things and it is your role to tell us no because it's exceeded the bandwidth. So I understand that that's part of like the, uh, the, the give and take here. I, I guess if there were, if I were to add like two elements of QC that I, I, I would appreciate, one would be pretty easy and probably something you're already considering, which is karyotype. And then uh, the second thing that I would think would be nice, but probably not necessary on top of the transcriptomics would be the attack seek. Um, I think the transcriptomics would tell you a lot about um, what that cell thinks that it is within the kidney, but I think that the epigenetic landscape would also give you a good measure as to how well that cell represents the adult kidney uh, epithelial epigenetic landscape, and so may have a uh, allow allow people to 
compare it to some of the emerging data sets, such as the one that Ben was describing, I don't know, 45 minutes ago. Terry, you have a uh, yeah. Up. So yeah, I was going to ask Jeremy, and I guess ask you all. I mean, my concern with that is that it may change over time. So you know, we may do the attack seek, do the transcripts, tomics. You know, we stick it in the minus eighty or whatever. And you know, obviously, we heard from Ben; it's a, a really costly, and I worry that it will change over time. So what we do at at one fixed time point may not address your concern. But but I think that that's that's I I think that's a reason to do it not not to do it quite honestly okay. because if the cells are evolving over time you want to know that and so I'd say that that would be a uh, if you're having epigenetic drift and I suspect that you may especially with passage number then you you're going to want that to be a variable that your user community can keep track of. Well, Jeremy, another thing to consider is that if the cells put in culture, they're going to they're going to change their gene expression compared to what we're seeing from then. Um, so, you know, I think I think being able to use isogenic cell lines and document uh, changes in gene expression with the knockout of PKD1 and PKD would be informative. Um, you know, regardless of whether or not they directly matched to the gene expression that you find in, in the tissue. I, I, absolutely. Uh, I think it could be informative, but as, there, are pro, there are lots of existing kidney renal, renal epithelial cells that we think are probably not good proxies for human kidney. And, um, and yes, I think that the community can use those already to start to define the genetic functions of PKD1 and PKD2. I, I think the holy grail, would, though, would be an immortalized kidney human epithelial cell line that we did think retained a lot of the same biological characteristics as a normal human kidney epithelial cell in you or me. And so I... I, I agree that genetic experiments can be done on imperfect proxies for the kidney epithelium, but why not shoot for something that is a is a more faithful model? And I think that type of analysis that I was describing would give us some sort of hint as to whether that was a more faithful model or not relative to what already exists. So Jer Jeremy, I'd like to just tell you what we've been up to and then get your feedback. And so um, on one hand, I think Maryland has been driven behind the mouse cell lines because it's a lot easier to take a mouse that has been engineered already, cross it with a morta mouse and get immortalized cells. Um, with the human cells, that's a different ball game because uh, you, you start with cells and then you have to engineer them. And one of the biggest challenges we have is stable karyotype. And so if you're trying to engineer lots of components into the cells, uh, that uh, ends up being a huge challenge. And that gets to your, like a little bit to your question about are we karyotyping? And the answer is yes, when we have to, and that's when we have to, like, uh, and, uh, but, you know, when we don't have to, maybe that's the mouse cell lines. And then if you want to engineer those, well, then it's up to you to, you know, uh, capture that uh, because the karyotype probably also changes in passage. Um, I can tell you some good news with the mouse cell lines and stability, at least between five passages, early passages, the Transcription profile uh, doesn't change very much. And it's at least with the one that we've done, um, it doesn't change very much. And it stays uh, pretty much like the origin cell type that we started with. Um, and uh, the uh, transcriptional signature that we get when we induce knockout is pretty reproducible. So I, I think at least an early passage uh, in one cell line, we have something. But the 
The challenge now is to have all nephron segments represented and probably male and female. And this is where we're taking it. And that's where the expense and all of the genomics comes in, uh, how much we could really do. I think, um, you know, uh, I think that's a real issue is, is the cost of doing all of it. So I think we can do one or two cells, cell uh, lines, but more than that, it's, uh, we, you know, we could do it collaboratively, something like that. Understood. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Thanks, Paul. That is really encouraging about the mouse cell line stability with the transcriptome. I mean, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I, I've got another topic thinking about cell lines. Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. <laughs> okay, thanks, Darren. I mean, uh, I think Jack might be in the room. And so there are probably people who could speak to this more fully than I could. But um, um, thinking about it, the topic that you just raised, Paul, representation of all the different cell types along the proximal distal nephron. Uh, organoids obviously are kind of an emerging technology that would allow for many of those cell types to be represented from a single cell type. IPSCs don't have the same issues with loss of karyotype or change of karyotype or passage number. Uh, and are much more amenable to genetic engineering than even uh, immortalized somatic cells. Is that something that you all are considering taking on? Um, uh, various different genotypes within human iPSCs that may be conditional? John, do you want to uh, take that up? Yeah, so this is, um, this is a great question. I mean, obviously, I'm a little bit biased. I think it's a good question in the sense that um, you know, making these immortalized cell lines has, has been a little bit trickier than we had hoped. Um, largely come to your karyotypic problems. The ones we've made so far with SV40 um, seem to progress from a diploid to a polyploid status and then, you know, a little bit crazier after that. And so um, we've been trying different approaches to do that. But one of the other approaches is to go to iPSCs, like you said, and do the engineering in that stage. And then the the plan, at least, is to see if we can, um, well, there's a couple different plans. One version would be to try to differentiate in using a couple different uh, protocols to differentiate into an epithelial cell line after the engineering is done. And, you know, that's where I kind of liked your suggestion. I was, I was kind of wondering if we couldn't use, you know, attack, seek, and kind of subcloned lines to decide where, what those are like or which ones are most closely representative to the uh, I guess the in vivo situation, um, you know, it's always tricky because you, you heard Ben talk about it. These are end stage, right? So are we, are we, you know, what, what, how close is good and how close is, you know, too far. Right? So, but along those lines, yeah. And then the other side is the organoid side, which I think is uh, uh, also useful. So we've engineered uh, PKD1, PKD2 knockouts so far. We're right now trying to engineer conditional alleles in the IPSCs um we're not there yet um and the hope is to you know get everything into these ipscs that we want to engineer including the drivers for cree or flip or depending on what we want to do and then um you know this is where we debate this often is that what what step or do we do and what part do we just provide the resource to the community and let them take it from that point um and we're, we're more than willing to hear uh people's ideas on this uh right now you know there's only so far we think we can you know if we dedicate more to the differentiation and everything else we have to take away just because of financial limits uh from other things we're trying to do um and so which is important as far as at what point is it a good resource to provide the community with and right now we have uh, i definitely know pkd2 we've done westerns we've shown that it's knocked out we have those so pkd1 um, I'm just a little slow on, you know, committing to putting that out there until we see the Westerns that show no protein. Um, these are always debated also topic is how far do we go in characterizing these, right? Uh, do we have to show that they are, are able to make teratomas? Do we have to show, you know, what level are they as a good IPSCs? And, and, you know, these are all good questions. I mean, 
Yeah, that sounds awesome, John. Got any jeans you think we should make? Uh, I mean, I, I I like the conditional idea a lot um, because I think that uh, avoiding some of the developmental trajectory issues upon loss of PKD1 or PKD2 might be important. I don't know. Uh, again, I, I defer to people who actually have experience making organoids because I don't. Um, uh, so I like the conditional approach. I, I hear what you're saying, John, about all the various different Cree drivers that you could use. Um, I ma might imagine like a 6-2 Cree or a PAX-8 Cree ERT2 uh, would be really useful to the community. Uh, um, somewhat inspired by what Ben was saying, another cell line that could be useful on top of the CRISPR would be uh i mean on top of the conditional would be a crispr i approach uh which might allow people to do epigenetics relatively quickly on top of uh i mean epistasis rather on top of the uh, loss of either pkd1 or pkd2 and test gene gene interactions in a, in a cell line but that's probably getting a little too greedy so we're uh, developing that with uh, the PKD2 mouse line. Not uh, this is a grant that I have. It, it's a side. So um, that's the strategy. Um, we'll let you know how that goes in a few months. I hope. Fantastic. Sounds great, Michael. I, I want to get your thoughts about the organoid approach uh you know it's uh strengths and limitations and what people may want to know before they jump in the deep end yeah so i think the organoids could be very powerful and and i agree with all that's been said about the potential of ipscs i think that that the elephant in the organoid room and one that i'm really interested in from a basic science perspective is their topology because uh, at least the organoids i've seen so far and and actually i will say the ones in the talk we heard earlier today the the mouse organoids didn't uh fall into this category but the ones that we've seen so far tend the cysts tend to form inside out in other words, the apical membrane faces the, the outside world and not the lumen of the cyst. The, the ones we saw earlier today from, from Greg's lab seem to have the correct topology. I think if we're going to be using the organoids as ways of either exploring cystogenesis or uh, as screening tools for potential therapies, the topology may not be uh, a limiting or deal-breaking factor, but we need to understand it, and we need to consider that as we consider what assays we can use these for. Thank you, Michael. Greg, I wonder if you uh, are there and you can hear us, uh, if you might want to chirp in and talk uh, a little bit more about uh, the mouse uh, model, how you got it to work the way it did. It just, it looks like a beautiful system to me. So I'd, I'd defer to actually to uh, uh, Yu Ishimoto, who's also on the call to, to actually speak about the sp specifics. And again, you know, the early characterization suggests that the polarization is right, but we really want to do a lot more detailed characterization to be sure that, well, again, as you mentioned in this talk, that, you know, with apical markers, the apical membrane really is on the inside of the lumen and the basolateral side is where we think it is. Again, it looks like the cilia are facing the right way, um, but it's still it's still uh, we need we need more characterization to be absolutely certain that's true and that it's reliably true across this set of cell lines. But the the nice thing about the the, the uh, NPS system is that it is uh, it is it seems to be robust. We have multiple, as you saw, multiple independently derived cell lines that reproducibly have that genetic difference, including a, a conditional line. So we're we're hopeful. But I think uh, to Michael Kaplan's point, I think it really is, it is important to be sure in the characterization that the orientation is something that we would expect to see in vivo. And I don't know if you wants to say anything or add anything to that specifically. 
Oh, thank you, thank you, Greg. So I don't have something to say, but I'd like to know so which kind of apical marker or bilateral marker you recommend to use for me. So, so I have to do a lot of things. So I'd like to know, I'll say a lot of stuff. So what kind of thing you recommend me to do? How to how to evaluate and how to how to how to show how to good topology of this my organoid. So, so I think you've done some nice work already by looking at cilia, but uh, I would suggest looking at standard markers of membrane polarity, sodium potassium ATPase, uh, apical markers for whichever segment you think your cysts are deriving from, and just getting a sense of, uh, you know, at a very basic level, which way are they facing. So immunocytochemistry should, should be able to help you. Oh, thank you very much. So I'm not sure. So this organoid is not adult kidney. So I'm not sure what kind of markers they are expressing in this kind of early sure. embryonic kidney level. Yeah. yeah. Sodium pump should be there either way. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Do they form cysts within the collagen? I wasn't entirely clear. Or was that in the media? Oh, th th yeah, thank you for your question. So it's in the media. So, but I also try to do different I would say differentiation condition using gel. So maybe that using gel makes more obvious cystic structure compared with the, only the medium condition. Are there any other questions that might be on a different topic? Can I ask you a question? Yes. Hi, I'm Ise from Japan. I have two questions. You talk about the IPS cells uh, that could be uh, resources. Uh, you know, the different IPS cells have a different capacities. So when you make a IPS cells, I want both PKD1 and 2 knockout, and also from the patient, that would be great. You know, then we can make an organism or something that we want. You hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So you know, I'm. I try to want. I want to make an organ if I can. So that's what I want. Yeah. John, how difficult would that be to, to obtain IPS? Uh, let me just say. Uh, I, mean, the, the, I mean, the cells we have right now are a wild type to start with, and that's all. All that's all we've worked with so far. But I can see your desire for a patient to arrive. I mean, we it's not impossible. We'd have to get fibroblasts and then have to just reprogram them into IPS cells. But I guess I'm trying to question what would be the advantage of that over a derived? Um, I mean, I could see if you're talking about like cystic epithelium, having a, a cell that's derived from a cystic environment as opposed to a normal environment, there may be other epigenetic or other you know, other modifications that occur in that case. But when you reprogram the IPS cells, they should wipe, re reprogram that whole IPS uh, system. Uh, and again, I'm not against this, but maybe you could tell me what you think the advantage of a patient-derived IPS cell would be. You know, you, you the, yeah, 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 yeah. The one we have is usually like a knockout, right? So, but the, from the patient, they are mutant, mutant. So that could be have a different uh, effect, like a dominant or negative or whatever. So that you can test. And you know, well, people me, are talking me, about let, those. Are, yeah. Let me ask you this: If this, I mean, if we we've talked about um, creating patient-derived mutations in the IPS, like PKD two or PKD one. Um, in fact, we have a we're still kind of working out the QC of this, but we have a IPS cell line that has a halo tag on the very C terminus, and we've been thinking about editing uh, the PKD two with different mutations for patients. Now, would that satisfy your need? Or yeah, that's else? that's also yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So both knockout and the mutant from the you know any like a typical IPSA line, but I, in I this think, case, yeah, yeah, that's probably the way that will go rather than generate a bunch of IPS yeah. cells from patients. True, true, true. We yeah. can give you fibroblasts if you want to do that yourself I know that. Uh, but we Sorry. we have a limitation and funding uh 
they are about $10,000 to generate each uh, IPS cell line. Um, it, it isn't cheap and it isn't uh, straightforward. And then you live with whatever, you know, whatever fibroblast that you started with. Uh, it's just, it's not just the mutation. It's everything that the patient had on top yeah, of that. True, true, true. Yeah. So yeah, you know, both the yeah, patient maybe not a good idea just from the general IPS. But in this case, I want not only one IPS line, but several, like two or three different IPS lines would be great. Because you know each one is different, right? Just to clarify, uh, there's two ways of interpreting that. Do you want different clones of the same knockout? No, or no, different, different different mutations. Deep, no, different original IPS series. So, you know, there are so many different IPS series in the world and some are good for making kidney and some are not good. So, you know, that will be great. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, that's something we haven't pursued yet. Uh, that, I'll be honest, the IPS cells we're using right now, the part of the reason why we're using this one is we've been told that it's a lot easier to share. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's not very many restrictions associated with this IPS cell. And that's why we've gone with it. But to be honest, it's a great question of whether this can make uh, whether organoids or yeah. uh, epithelial cells, we haven't got to that yet, yeah, so I yeah, can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking that it's this session's about over. I, I saw something flash up uh, a couple of minutes ago saying that they, we had 30 seconds left. <laughs> um, I thought they were going to kick us out. <laughs> But um, I don't know if we leave the room and then go back to the main, the main room for, I guess it's, there's nothing after this, right? Well, anyways, if there's any other questions, go ahead and uh, either uh, contact the, the consortium and we'll try to address them. But otherwise, uh, thanks for your, your input and the, the discussion.